So somebody mentioned to me that I didn't actually introduce myself at the beginning. I, <laughs> I, I think I know most of you, but just in case I don't, I, I'm John Eastman. I'm, a, I'm the Henry Salvatore Professor of Constitutional Law here at Chapman. Uh, uh, but my, my main hat for today is I'm a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and a director of its Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. Um, I want to kind of close this up because uh, the question that uh, Reverend Sheldon uh, asked there, what are we going to do about this? And I'm going to uh, give some uh, ideas, uh, but also describe what we have been doing about it already and, and invite you all to, um, to join us in the effort. So... Um, Judge Batchelder talked today about the Commerce Clause stuff. It was one of the things I mentioned in, her, uh, in my introduction of her. Um, what, way back in, 1970, in 1999, when we founded the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, that was the first set of cases we got involved with. You may remember uh, John Roberts, uh, when he was uh, first um, nominated, one of the things that got him in trouble was a dissenting opinion he'd written in uh, the Arroyo Toad case. Now, the Arroyo Toad, I'm going to tell the story of the Arroyo Toad. Well, he called it that hapless toad, and that's what got him in trouble. The environmentalists didn't think he was suitably solicitous of the environmental laws. But it's a really important lesson on federalism and separation of powers. Um, uh, Congress has, in its infinite wisdom, decided to regulate endangered species that trans uh, cross state lines um, because of the, uh, the concern that no state was protecting them enough if they weren't the only state affected by it. The Arroyo Toad, however, lives entirely in Southern California. Um, he, he spends his whole life maybe hopping a mile from where he's born. Um, <laughs> And he doesn't cross the Mojave Desert to get over to Nevada or Arizona. Some of them sneak down across the border to Mexico. They're reverse illegal immigrant toads. <laughs> but California has a very sensible policy. Uh, we only call it a species endangered if it's actually endangered. Um, uh, that means there's so few of them that we're about to lose the species. Well, federal law is a little different. It's endangered in all or a portion of its range. Now, how can it be endangered in a portion of its range? That really means it's not endangered. So the Arroyo Toad in the wet years kind of migrated as far north as Santa Barbara. And then when the dry years came back, it started heading back south a little bit. Uh, I may have that backwards. It may be the dry years that got up there as far. Anyway, they, but, but all of a sudden, it wasn't endangered because there's billions of them, but it was endangered in the Santa Barbara portion of its range. And that gave the federal government the ability to regulate this thing, completely contrary to the sensible state regulations on the ground. And what happened as a result? Well, we now regulated not just the toad, but all of its habitat, not just the range that it normally used, but the range that it visited on vacation in those nice days. Uh, and including all of the mountain ranges around Southern California, all became designated as Royal Toad habitat. And we weren't able to clean out the dead underbrush and the mountain ranges. And that created 10 years ago the ring, what we called the ring of fire. Uh, with, with, we, we had created this fire hazard in our fire ranges protecting the habitat of the Arroyo Toad. And when it all went up in a tinderbox, the habitat, the Arroyo Toads, and a whole lot of other stuff were lost in the process. So it's not just constitutionalism, but it's unbelievably idiotic policy. Well, we started pushing those Commerce Clause cases uh, more than a decade ago. The solid waste, uh, what, what uh, one of our panelists referred to as the Swank case, Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. How do I know that? Well, we, we were one of, the, one of the principal parties in that case. And this was a wonderful case. There had been a, mine, a, a, a pit mine in Cook County, Illinois. And they dug, there was this big hole in the middle of the ground, and the town's folks, after they got all of the minerals out of it, decided we need to do something with this. We can just fill it back in, or we can site our, um, our next trash dump there, because there's already a hole in the ground, and we'll be filling this up in the process. A very good thing. I mean, think about how hard it is for local folk to decide they're going to put their own trash dump right next door, and they had done this. Well, when it rained, the bottom of this pit got filled with water until there was enough uh, uh, evaporation for the water to go away. The Army Corps of Engineers claimed that, therefore, it was part of the navigable waters of the United States. And, and without the permit, the town couldn't put this dump in this pit. I mean, this is how crazy it gets. Now, why is it important? Look at the 40,000-foot the, the 40, 
broader and why our involvement in the case I think was so significant. People were arguing about whether this fit within the definition of waters in the United States or not. We filed a brief in the case to the Supreme Court that kind of reminded folks of what the legal authority for the waters of the United States rule was in the first place. There's no provision in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution to regulate the waters of the United States, to regulate um, pits, uh, you know, mining pits. Or anything. There's, no, there's no authority in the Constitution to do that. The constitutional hook was the Interstate Commerce Clause the power to regulate commerce among the states. And early on, that meant that the federal government got to rec regulate the navigable waters of the United States. Not, not all navigable waters, only those of the United States, which meant not waters that were entirely in, uh, inside a single state. You didn't get to navigate, uh, to regulate uh, a lake in the middle of Ohio, even if it was navigable, because that was Ohio's business, not Washington's business. And the statute actually defines waters of the United States as those things that are navigable, navigable to the point of interstate commerce. Right. And, and, and it was that constitutional authority that created the language, but also limited the scope of the federal government. People quit talking about it in those terms until we weighed back in. And I think it's important to recognize that we've got to put that stuff back before the courts. Now, five years ago, we decided that one of the biggest problems of late was this notion that the federal agencies are doing whatever they want to do, quite divorced from any statutory language. We call it in fancy legal terms the Chevron de deference doctrine and the, the demise of the non-delegation doctrine. Let me put it in layman's terms because, because our Constitution is actually written so even lawyers can understand it, but the rest of us ought to be able to. Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution is pretty unambiguous. All the legislative powers herein granted, not all legislative powers, but only the ones herein granted, are vested in a Congress of the United States. Not the FTC or the SEC or the OSHA or the CFPB or all these other alphabet soup agencies, but are vested in a Congress in the United States. That means Congress has to make the laws. They can't pass the authority away of uh, making the laws to some unelected bureaucratic agency. Well, we started five years ago reminding the court that their deference doctrines that had developed like barnacles over the years on the ship of state were a violation of that fundamental core principle of separation of powers. It's not buried deep into the Constitution. You know, I mean, even short-sighted, uh, short attention span members of Congress can get to Article I, Section 1, Clause 1 without much difficulty. It's the very first clause after the preamble in the Constitution. Um, we started doing that, like I said, five years ago. And only, and, and, and by the way, Justice Scalia, whom I have, hold in high regard, um, was one of the authors of one of the major deference decisions. And so we had to confront him on this as well. Now, why was he in favor of these deference to the agencies? Well, he, was, he had grown up in an era when the courts were doing everything. Uh, the Warren Court of the 1960s was, this, was just this overreach court. And so he thought, well, at least if we're given deference to the executive branch, they're, they're at least theoretically accountable to the president whom we elect rather than an unelected judiciary. And so he became a big fan of these deference doctrines. And so we started pointing out what a disaster that had been. Uh, it, it was neither the courts nor the executive that ought to be writing the laws because Article I says Congress should do it. Well, just within the last year before his death, he had told Clarence Thomas, you know, uh, some of our doctrines here just don't make any damn sense. <laughs> like that our case. Well, Clarence Thomas pointed out to him, you know, Nino, that was your opinion. He said, I know, it doesn't make any damn sense. <laughs> we need to repeal that. And so, and, and so as one of our panelists this morning pointed out, just in the last year or two, uh, there have been half a dozen opinions uh, by Justice Thomas and others on the court questioning these deference doctrines, reviving the notion of non-delegation, saying we've got to confront this stuff if we're going to put this behemoth back in the bottle and start getting back to constitutional law. Now, one of the questions was, are we just, you know, kind of swinging at the edges here um, and gone too far beyond this that we all live in caves and it's really lost? I remind people that back in the 1970s, Constitutional law textbooks in this country had quit even containing a copy of the Constitution. It had become so irrelevant to constitutional law. Um, uh, then organizations like, uh, like the Claremont Institute were founded in 78, the, Her uh, the Heritage Foundation, uh, the, the Federalist Society, uh, 
uh, the Federalist Society has been transformational, for example, in, in, in bringing this debate and these discussions uh, to our nation's law schools, to the point now where, where if you argued that the, the founders believed something in 1970, people would laugh you out of the room. What does that matter? Now people pretend to argue what the founders would have thought, even if they know that it's false. They think it's that critically important to the arguments in the Supreme Court that they at least pretend to be following what the original Constitution said. That that's a, that's a dramatic transformation in a relatively short period of time, 30, 35 years. So I do think there's hope. Now, what the Claremont Institute has been doing to bolster that, you heard about our fellowship programs. Let me tell you a couple of names of people who have gone through those programs that you might have heard of. Mark Levin, Laura Ingram, uh, the senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton. I mean, these are the kind of people we're churning out in those programs. Uh, Joey Tartakovsky and Lawrence Van Dyke, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Scott Keller, the solicitor general now of Texas. Uh, these are the kind of people that we're putting out. You know, I, I, I've often said every time I hear a great speech out of some member of Congress, I, I can guarantee you there's, there's, there's probably a Claremont Institute fellow working on that person's staff. <laughs> And it's true uh, that, that the, the power of these ideas that the founders gave to us are so profound and so important that if you just equip people to know what they are and put them in positions of influence, they're going to start having that ripple effect to turn things around. I mean, think about it. Think about it from the point of view of this country in 1774. A ragtag group of people, ragtag, barely had muskets, and we're going to take on the largest power until that point that the world had ever seen. Think about how extraordinary a thing it must have meant to take that on. They came together. They were committing treason when they put their names to that Declaration of Independence. A small group of people, smaller, a smaller group of people than are sitting in this room right now. And they changed not just the course of this country, but the course of the world. A decade later, having made some missteps on creating the Articles of Confederation that wasn't working out so well, they gave us the greatest constitution that the world has ever known. It is now the longest surviving constitution in history. Right? And, and, and even though we don't pay much attention to it anymore, the American people have this deep felt view that when you point out something to be unconstitutional, that that's wrong, and they fight back against it. We've got an education problem, not a culture problem on that, right? Which means we've got to put people in, in points of power and points of influence to educate. Mark Levin, in a single day, reaches more <laughs> people than, than most of us can even imagine, right? And, and he's got a Claremont education. Tom Cotton, when he came out here, he did a couple weeks in the Publius program, and he realized, boy, a couple weeks isn't going to be enough, and he stayed, he stayed for a full year, right? These are the kind of things for, of which the, the kind of change I think you're all yearning for uh, 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 where they begin. Um, so, you know, uh, and, 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 and it's, it, it's so critically important. Let me give you a couple of other things. Uh, this administration... It, it's almost like they take this uh, unconstitutional conduct as a badge of honor because they use it in all things great and small. I mean, we've heard a lot today about the great things, the, 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 not great, that's, you know, that's not the right, the, the large things, the catastrophic things, the immigration bill, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act waivers, the Clean Power Plan, the waters of the United States, this, this ridiculous thing in Title IX. But even petty things they do that. They renamed Mount McKinley without any statutory authority at all, directly contrary to the law. And nobody, you know, they do the voter intimidation stuff. Um, uh, they've redirected billions of dollars of our Africa uh, anti-malaria and anti-poverty things into LGBT causes to try and, you know, just, again, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution addresses this stuff. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury but by an appropriation authorized by law. So when they, when, they, when they do these things, it's not just that they're disagreeing with us on policy. They are acting without constitutional authority, or as James Madison say, as despots and tyrants. Right? And what do we do with despots and tyrants? Well, we at least throw them out of office and quit funding them. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Now, Judge Batchelder mentioned uh, during her lunch talk about how the Anti-Federalists were right. And she was certainly right uh, uh, about, the, um, uh, about their in interpretation of what the judiciary would start doing. Um, but there was another aspect, and I want to tell a story of a student of mine a few years ago in my Federalist-Anti-Federalist -Federalist seminar. 
Uh, she had looked at some, I, I had them read these side-by-side -side Federalist papers and Anti-Federalist writings, and she came up and says, you know, the Anti-Federalists predicted the federal government would get large and out of control, and boy, were they right. And I said, well, were they? It took a century and a half for that to happen. Why do you think it didn't happen for the first century and a half? And so she went back to the drawing board, and she discovered, she says, you know, um, the federal government actually stayed pretty small for most of our nation's history. It wasn't until we removed the power of the states from choosing senators to the Senate and took them out of the mix with the 17th Amendment that all hell started to break loose. And, and so, so uh, last week we, had our, we devoted our Teletown Hall forum to an effort that's underway to repeal the 17th Amendment. Think, think about... Now, now, how many people in Washington are talking about such a structural change? Nobody, all right? It takes a little bit of folks outside the Beltway to kind of see from afar some of the things that ought to be obvious. That if one of the roles of the state governments was to keep the federal government in check, when you mo remove their electoral body from the halls of the federal government, they're going to have less of an influence in, in fulfilling that check. A very simple, minor constitutional structural change that has had devastating consequences. Um, there's another thing underway, uh, uh, and it will start in Williamsburg this Thursday night. Uh, uh, the Article 5 uh, Convention of States movement is holding the first constitutional convention. Now, it's a simulation. We're going to try and work out the bugs. The first constitutional convention that we've held in this country since 1787 will occur this weekend, next weekend, in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to tell you I'm one of the delegates from California to that thing, but we've got people from all 50 states coming in to try and start thinking about how we're going to re redefine the structural limitations on the federal government to start, um, uh, as the founder said in the Declaration of Independence, to exercise our not just our right but our duty to alter or abolish our government when they cease being becoming protective of the inalienable rights that we have from our creator. Now this is not a revolutionary thing because it's, a, it's an authority specifically provided for in Article 5 of the Constitution, one we have never used. Now, why did they give it to us if we've never used it? Well, all of the amendments we've had have come out of Congress, right? Uh, and that's good, and that's all well and good, uh, unless the problem is that the federal government, including the Congress, has become part of the problem. Do we really expect that Congress itself to take the lead in proposing an amendment to limit its power? <laughs> all right, no. So Madison and his buddies back in Philadelphia in 1787 were really prescient. They knew that if the problem become too strong a federal government, that it would require something outside of the federal government to provide a remedy. Article 5, the Amendments Convention, is designed to do just that. Uh, and so watch more for that. Go to their website and join up in the effort. Uh, there's another m uh, movement afoot out there that takes a couple of clauses on the Constitution and merges them together. The Article 5 convention route with the ability of states to enter into a compact. One of the concerns about the Article 5 convention route is, well, what if we have this convention? What if it becomes a runaway convention? What if they do crazy things, like we haven't had crazy things going on for the last 80 years already? I remind people that take that position, we've been sitting in a permanent constitutional convention every time the Supreme Court meets with Justice Kennedy <laughs> casting the fifth vote. Um, uh, but, 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 you know, right now, politically, the, the, the constitutional crowd uh, has an overwhelming majority in the states, in the state governorships, in the attorney generalships. 69 out of the 99 state legislators are run by Republican. Now, that's not synonymous with constitutionalists. I understand that. But it's a whole lot better than the other side on those questions and most things. Um, the notion that bad stuff would come out of such a convention uh, and, 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 and get out of the convention at all, much less get ratified by 38 of the states when we have that kind of numerical majority the other direction, is fanciful. So these efforts are significant. But anybody that still has a concern about that, this other movement has combined that Article 5 convention with a state compact, where the states can reach a compact ahead of time, a legally enforceable compact, uh, that would define the scope of authority of that convention. And if their delegates exceed the scope of authority, it's, it's void and can be challenged. So lots of efforts going away, citizen homegrown efforts to try and address uh, many of these things. Um, 
let me let me uh, kind of close this out with this um, uh, on the substance of it. Um, we were talking about the federal funding and the inability of Congress um, to cut off funding for these agencies. Um, the politics of it have gotten so bad that if the Republicans try and shut down anything, the entire government is shut down and they're blamed for it even though they're not at fault. Well, we gotta be a little bit of creative and I wanna tell a story here. When I was working in the Reagan administration, I was at the Civil Rights Commission. Um, and dollar for dollar, the most controversial agency in town, probably because the couple of political appointees by Reagan didn't mesh well with the career staffers over at the Civil Rights Commission. Um, there, you remember, that you, how many of you have ever heard the, 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 the line that women only make 70 cents on the dollar of men, oh, yeah. right? Okay, now, we hired some of the best economists in the world to actually do a significant regression analysis study of that, right? And it turns out, if you control for such things like... Um, how much time in the workforce. Guess what, women tend to leave the workforce to have kids more often than men do. I don't know why that is. <laughs> um, but if you control for those things, it, the, the discrimination number didn't go away entirely, but it was more like 98 cents on the dollar, right? So we published this study, irrefutable study on the regression analysis. And the Democrats in charge of our appropriation budget over in the Senate hauled me up to Congress, forced me to testify. And Senator Frank Lautenberg, I'll never forget, he wagged his finger at me. <laughs> said, Mr. Eastman, that study you did, we don't like it. We don't like it one bit. <laughs> and you're going to stop that kind of stuff, or we're going to slash your budget. And I said, Senator, you don't de seem to understand the Reagan appointees very much. Why don't we slash that one all the way down to zero? I'll go over to the Department of Education and we'll start working on that one. <laughs> so, so we have some creative tools at our disposal if we're just willing to use them and that we send to people in Washington, folks, with enough knowledge but enough spine to kind of implement those tools and fight for us and fight for constitutionalism. That's what the Federalist Society has been doing and we're so honored to have them partner with us on this program today. That's what the Heritage Foundation has been doing and likewise happy to have them partner uh, with us institutionally as well today. But that's what, the, but they've got lots of budgets back there in Washington. What we need outside of DC is your help with what we're doing at the Claremont Institute. So let me throw a couple things out to you. Uh, to, to train one of our fellows over the summer, it costs us about $10,000. So get a group of people, Bring, hold a salon at your house and raise enough, raise $10,000 to help us tra train one of those uh, fellows over the summer. If you're really wealthy or know an investment banker who is and are so committed to this, 200,000, 20 times that will endow one in perpetuity. And think how much good we could do with that uh, down the road. Um, uh, these kind of things are important. We're training an army. Uh, we're training a generation of future James Madisons who understand the dynamics of separation of powers, that it's not just some technicality uh, that we can live with or, or uh, ignore as we want. It goes to the heart of the notion of legitimate self-government. The Constitution is the contract that we have with our government. It's the sole authority they have to do the things that we have asked of them to do. And the legitimate things that they can do are set out there right in the Declaration is minutes. It's not, it's not to take money from groups and give it to somebody else. It's to secure our inalienable rights that exist prior to government and that are not the gift of government, but they're a gift of the creator. That's the sole legitimate purpose of government. That's what we have consented to. And when they do all the rest of the crap that they're doing, they are acting us as usurpers of power. Um, we need to remind them of that in the most forceful terms so that we can get this thing back on the constitutional tracks and back to the success and prosperity that this greatest nation, this greatest constitution, the greatest declaration of independence and its founding principles the world has ever seen have conveyed and bequeathed to us. It's up to us now to carry that forward and I invite all of your assistance in that effort, particularly while we're downstairs drinking wine and good wine. Let Michael, let Michael close. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, it's never a good idea to stand between a group and a <laughs> cocktail reception. So I, I, I just want to re reinforce what John said. Please do contribute to the Claremont Institute. I think there are pledge cards somewhere on the table or in bags. And 
you can always go online and we, we do think we do a lot of great work, but we can't do it without your support. I mean, we need to support the fellowship programs, the work of, of John and his colleagues at CCJ, the Claremont Review of Books. So anything that you can do would be helpful. I mean, people here think we, we, this movement needs to do much more, and it really does need to do much more, but it has to start with funding what we're doing now and expanding on that. So I appreciate everyone coming, and I appreciate all the ideas and enthusiasm, and now, Let's go to the cocktail party and very good. Great. Thank you.